Okay, so let's talk about the second main argument in the Chris paper. So this is about rational desire and choice, although as well, you'll see in a second, I'm not super sure that that is the proper title, but let's come back to that. Okay, so let's see what um, Arrington is trying to say. Um, so let's think about first why we would think that possibly a, um, a desire that is the result of persuasive advertising wouldn't be rash wouldn't be rational and um if you think of the case of the uh, carl's jr ad you know where if literally what's going on is you see the ad um that causes you to want to go to carl's jr but the reason why you want to go to carl's jr is this association that has been sort of smuggled in between the going to carl's jr and sex which makes absolutely no rational sense. So thank you, iOS. So th if that's what we're thinking of as irrational, then, um, well, try to keep that in mind. All right. So the first thing that might be said about being irrational or about the desires resulting from advertising being irrational is that, you know, a person might be not, like sort of not fully informed. So, Sometimes we say that a, a you know a person's choices are irrational because they're kind of not operating off of all the relevant information. So that's the starting point where where Arrington's coming in. So let's he, notice he says you know, okay, it's not they're often he's so Arrington's responding to somebody who says okay, well if you want stuff on the basis of advertising, it's going to be irrational because you don't know all of the facts, right? Um, and I guess you could say, well, maybe the facts, the relevant facts here are things like there is no sex at the Carl's Jr. Um, but Arrington says, hey, look, this, and I should probably use a different pen, um, this argument fails, says Arrington, because we don't think that we, you have to have all the facts about every decision for that decision to be rational. That would be crazy, right? You, you don't need to know all the subatomic facts about, you know, particles and waves and stuff uh, just to know whether or not you want a taco. So you don't need all of the facts. You just need relevant information if your decisions are going to be rational. All right. And so then the thought is for the person, Arrington, who wants to defend advertising on this front, they say, OK, well, look, and advertising can give you some kinds of uh, it can give you relevant facts. And so therefore it can help your decisions be rational. Um, now, that was informational advertising, right? So we want to know whether or not persuasive advertising can do the same kind of thing. Um, and so here's now the, the crucial bit, right? So presumably Pongo Peach is like cosmetics are associated with some adventuresome, uh, you know, awesome time, I guess. I don't know what the ads are. Um, so if somebody buys the the cosmetics because of that you know they're like oh if i have this lip gloss i'll look like you know it'll be like i'm on a desert island having a great time although desert island might not be a great time but whatever and errington says yeah that could be totally rational if that's you know sort of what you're wanting to achieve by buying the lip gloss um it's that could be totally fine because what you're trying to do is purchase the feeling you're not trying to purchase you know the trip to the island right um, so the thought is then, you know, if persuasive advertising causes you to want, uh, the product, uh, because it's going to make you feel a certain way, then your decision to buy the product could be perfectly rational because, you know, it is conducing to that feeling, right? So that's Arrington's position. Now we're going to do, um, now we're going to take up, uh, Chris's response. Okay. So now this is all so far, this was all Arrington, right? And now Chris is going to start hammering away. And the first thing I want to say about Chris just, and this is a bit of a definitional point, but um, look what he did here. He goes, for a desire to be rational in any plausible sense, that desire must at least not be induced by the interference, interference of other persons with my systems of taste uh, against my will and without my knowledge. Now, does that sound familiar to you? I mean, it probably should because it's just this thing again. Right. Crisp has just basically smuggled in his, his uh, 
claim about you know sec the thing that the second order desire that all autonomous people will have he's just kind of built that now into his definition of rationality um that actually doesn't have to be a problem for him um but i do think that that's a stronger version of and i of what counts as rational than most philosophers would accept these days um so but let's not worry too much about that let's work our way through the rest of this um okay so I think this part is actually really useful for understanding what was going on in the previous, uh, pre previous stuff up here, because this is where he's really saying, um, he's trying to explain why it would be that the desires that, that just, or that are, that, um, that the persuasive advertising works through can't give you the reasons to buy the product that you, you know, you think you have. Right. So he says, um, this is him, you know, sort of spelling out in detail what that unconscious desire is supposed to be, right? Um, so he says, you know, can you imagine somebody, like, when you're asking them, like, why are you going to buy that lift glass? And they're like, well, I have this unconscious desire for adventure. And, you know, I've seen these ads that link it together. So therefore, you know, I think it's totally fine, right? And Crisp's right, you know, you spell it out like that, and it does sound pretty crazy, um, or at least you know, not fully rational. Um, so he says, look, it's not actually, the problem's not with, you know, whether or not that agent, that person with this desire on the basis of the advertising. It's not that they don't, you know, sort of um, know something. It's not that they're missing something. It's that they, uh, or it's not that they're, you know, missing facts, which remember, that's where we kind of started off with up here. Um, but it's that, they actually are just sort of, uh, it's the way that the desire has come about. It's come about in a way uh, through a technique which the agent can accept, right? And it has its sort of structure is a reason that can actually do the justifying. So it's going to be, and so notice, remember I said that CRISP is basically just making rational something like a synonym of autonomous. Uh, doesn't have to be all the way, but, you know, look, look what he does right here. He says, such a desire will be repudiated by the agent as non-autonomous. And oh yeah, I'm not talking about autonomy in this section. So, so, so yeah, irrational. Yeah, okay. All right, that's just a bit of fun. Okay, now, um, this is all just kind of spelling out, the next bit here is just spelling out the same, uh, roughly the same kind of line, right? So it's talking about how the, the, um, the advertising works, right? Uh, so... First off, one concern is that it's actually not going to be effective, right? So it's not going to work. Uh, so if you buy the hair dye uh, because you think you're going to be promoted work or is surrounded by uh, admiring members of the opposite or let's just be uh, make everybody bisexual just so that we're all cool and we'll say and same, you know, so now we're cool, right? Uh, so I'm not unlikely to find myself being promoted at work or surrounded by mem admiring members of the opposite and same sex, right? Even if not bisexual, we still like others to look upon us fondly. So this is just straight deception, it, you know, because that's not actually going to happen when you buy the hair dye. Um, then he, he starts talking about, okay, so it's the, the mechanism, right? The, the thing that's problematic uh, is that the advertisements have... Um, so he says, you know, look, even if that did happen, and that's, it's good that he says that, right? Because um, especially when we're talking about beauty products, I mean, not cool that society works this way, but there, people do tend to uh, take the sort of promotion at work, right? Um, there are a lot of biases towards younger looking people um, young, and a lot of biases towards more attractive looking people. Um, those aren't necessarily good, but that does happen. So it really could be true in some cases that, um, you would, you know, that you might have a better chance of getting a date or getting promoted at work if you, uh, dye your hair. Um, so he needs to answer that a little bit. Um, he needs to, and he says, so look, even if the effects do manifest themselves, sorry, I already underlined it, uh, such advertisements have still overridden my autonomy. They have activated desires which lie beyond my awareness and over behavior flowing from which I therefore no, have no control. So the problem is the, you know, the uh, 
the mechanism. So the say, problematic mechanism, because you don't ha it's working in a way that you have no control over. Um, and then he says, you know, if these claims appear doubtful, consider whether, you know, if we basically make it explicit, whether that's actually going to work. You know, so here's an advertisement. Do you have a feeling of adventure? By the way, I don't know why he says have. Shouldn't that be want? Uh, but anyways, then use this brand of commercials or uh, c cosmetics, right? And so he's, what he's saying is like, look, if you made this, like the underlying message of the commercial explicit, it's not going to work. Um, and since, and that's a good sign that there's something going wrong when we allow um, the advertising to put the desires into our heads through this kind of unconscious mechanism, okay? Now, one thing that might be worth mentioning or thinking about is whether or not Crisp has really answered this. Um, because I think, you know, the way that he puts it out or the way that he kind of spells this out as he goes, um, what he thinks Arrington means, um, it seems like he's taking Arrington to be, or Arrington's claim to be really strong. Like, you know, am I really going to feel like I'm on a, on a exotic island vacation because I bought this lip gloss? No. I mean, that's, that's way too strong, right? You're not going to, you know, you, you, uh, uh, like the York peppermint patties, right? You're not going to be suddenly you bite into a, a, a little cookie like thing and you're not going to be on the top of a mountain. That's just not going to happen. So if that's really what you thought you were getting, you are need to head to a travel agent, not to the, you know, the candy store. But isn't it possible that a lot of things and brands and, and, and products do create the sub subjective kinds of feelings that Arrington has in mind? So, you know, think of like um, an outdoorsy brand, right? Uh, like, I don't know, North Face or something like that, where, you know, you buy um, the clothes that are from this particular brand that have this really strong association for you. Um, and, you know, maybe when you put on your North Face shirt, you do feel more outdoorsy and you do feel more like you're, you know, going out and having the kind of adventures that you like to have. So it could be that, you know, there are plenty of cases in which the subjective effects work. Now, does it, you know, again, Crisp has this, say, this second response, right, which is the same kind of deal that he's launched against the hair dye in the earlier argument. Again, you know, Crisp's response is basically, well, look, the connection between the product and the experience that you're hoping to have isn't going to be a rational one, right? He says, you know, the feeling of adventure is not going to come about. Wait, did I just do the right thing? Yeah, I think, okay, sorry, uh, too many lines here. Um, you know, where he says, oh, here it is. Uh, Consider whether the advertisement is likely to be successful. Do you have a feeling of adventure? Want a feeling of adventure? Then use this brand of cosmetics, right? This advertisement will fail in that it appeals to a conscious desire, uh, blah, 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 blah. But why is it so irrational to... You know, that, I mean, there's a reason why commercials don't work like that. It's boring. It doesn't have any attention. You know, it doesn't grab your attention and it doesn't actually make you have the feeling that the brand is trying to associate their product with. Right. That's how it works. We show you something. We make you feel a certain way. And then your brain being the dumb, lazy, you know, organ that it is, is like, oh, I felt that when I saw that. So those are connected. Right. So why is it? Why is that somehow an irrational connection, something that you couldn't possibly um, accept? And the answer seems like for Chris, but just has to be this really strong, um, you know, view about not being manipulated, that he's just assuming that everybody's going to have and have in the same uh, degree. And I, I have to admit, I'm actually kind of with Chris on this side. I'm a pretty, you know... Uh, big fan of uh, anti-manipulation and autonomy, you know, sort of not being compatible with a lot of that. But at the same time, I think it's worth thinking about whether or not um, there's room for us to want stuff on the basis of commercials that, you know, don't really rationally make sense, but make plenty of sense when we're thinking about kind of what products we might buy or what kind of products, you know, um, we like. Uh, one more thing on that, you know, just think about it this way. Um, suppose you are going on a date 
right? Um, and there's like the boring makeup that you could buy. And there's the makeup that's been sold to you in a way that makes you feel like you will be, you know, extra, extra attractive, extra sexy and all that good stuff. Right. Well, does it have to be somehow irrational to choose the one that has that association for you? I mean, here's at least one reason. Right. Um, If you feel like you're attractive when you're going on the date or if you feel, you know, like you're prepared when you go to the job interview, you're probably more likely to, you know, well, in one case, well, in both cases, I guess, have a successful date or have a successful job interview. Um, so it could be that these, I, it, it, it doesn't seem to me like there, it has to be the case that, those, that the association, even though it's not, you know, entirely rational, that that's going to be somehow autonomy undermining because in those cases where, you know, the association helps you act in the way that you want to act, that starts to sound like it's autonomy promoting. And it's not super clear to me that Crisp has left himself much room in this argument um, to, to accommodate that kind of claim. Okay, so that's, that was the second part, the rational desire and choice.